Okay, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to have this talk to you and I'm really looking forward to discuss some topics with you. I'm um, reading my talk today, not to stumble too much on words, but um, we'll see how that will work out. So let me give you my presentation. Here we are. And we're starting from the very top and now make it pretty. Okay. Oh, yes, I, uh, okay, look away, no spoilers, please. I don't know why this happens, I don't know. Boop, 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 boop. Almost there, keep going, keep going. There we are, hi, okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, as I saw, you already got some talks on the topic. Um, for example, from Franz Potter and other scholars of the field. And I hope that my examples and theories today can contribute to the overall topic of illustrating the Gothic. As for most of the time, sci the scientific community approaches, um, approach is a literary one or story driven. And my viewpoint stems from the visual culture and the history of art specifically. So this will be the main focus today. Beside the historical context and the conjunction with other media, I will heavily lean toward the art history, historical methods and theories. Um, please feel free to ask any questions if you're not familiar with some terms or something like that um, via the chat. We will have plenty of time to discuss. And Sam told me that there are some, maybe some artists beyond uh, the doing view. So please come through. I'm really looking forward to your approach to the pictures I'm showing you today. But first, I would like you to think on the last Gothic or horror book you thought of and you wrote or read. And uh, the last, maybe the last horror, horror or Gothic film you saw in cinema. Maybe, maybe you can go to cinema again. We in Germany are not open yet, but um, or at the home seminar on the silver screen. What was the last um, movie or book from the Gothic or horror genre which really stayed with you? Maybe you can consider a special scene which was really impressing or broke you <laughs> or something like that. As I mentioned this morning, maybe the pole from Hereditary might not make an interesting illustration or a nice poster, but everybody of course knows the image. But which scene would be um, an iconic scene that you would yourself put on the cover of a book or choose as a poster to introduce the story, the turning point, the selling point, what would be the one? Just think about it a little moment. And um, I maybe, um, I anticipated, oh, sorry, over here. Um, I anticipated some of those to be honest, those are my personal favorites. So here we are. It's of course the classic Frankenstein. It's Boris Karloff in his um, makeup. We have 28 days of, uh, um, days, days of night. And the scene that broke me is from, um, it follows <laughs> very a short glimpse only in the movie, but it really impressed me. Um, Crimson Peak, of course, like uh, as a new modern Gothic film. And um, Alien, I know that you also had a talk on Get Out. So this scene over here impressed me really, uh, um, um, really um, and it affected me really. And um, of course, it's just a short scene and not so impressive, but it stayed with me a long time. And Paul Tremblay has become one of my favorite authors of the modern Gothic. And um, you see over here the torture instruments which appear in the book as well. And of course, um, um, the Grudge, the Ring, and all of that, and Alien. So, okay, so that might be something you had in mind, or maybe something else. Um, maybe you was thought about something like this, and um, there are some intriguing images which spark curiosity and something else, dark settings, promising costumes, gruesome, or even ghostly, uh, gory ghosts. But I have to hate to break it to you at the very beginning of our about around about two hour course. Um, please curb your enthusiasm. Do not expect to see spectacular monsters or um, gruesome ghosts anytime soon. 
Um, for the canonical Gothic publication rarely presented them to its audience. Until the 1820s, the images were almost, almost interchangeable with other genres, especially novels with medieval content, for example. But why? And what did change? How did fear appear? Sorry for that thumb. Um, and most important, what can those images bring to the table when we talk about the Gothic? Well, these are the questions that will lead us through our sessions today. First, I will lay out the historical context in which the illustration of the Gothic novel blossomed. What was the background that the audience now expected books to not only offer a compelling story, but also to come with images? In the next step, we will then explore some images and media that influence those visualizations of the Gothic tropes and motives for let's not forget that the genre of the Gothic, the consequent combination of the ghostly or the paranormal, or not so paranormal in case of Anne Radcliffe, phenomenons and the medieval background was quite new. So how to put this into pictures? And at last, I would like us to do a close reading together on a selective sequence of illustrations and dig into the potential that different images for one and the same text could offer. Our first talking point is how the illustration of the Gothic novel started. The use of imagery of the novel in general can be used to understand the publishing, publishing practice in England in the 18th and 19th century. It was customary until the 1760s that the editions were only provided with a typical a typographically designed title page. You can see here what we mean when we speak of title page or from this piece. These terms identify the marked pages of a book and will come in handy if we speak later about the topic. And especially the frontispiece will become important for the figurative embellishment. Here you see um, the version of Castle of Edlin and Dunbine by Anne Radcliffe. And you see here it also is embellished with a little, little vignette over here. Um, yeah, that's a kind of an upgrade. And there we have the half title, which could also be embellished, but mostly was typograph typographically um, um, designed. Okay. I guess this you know. With the progress of the printing and publishing industry, and also the availability of paper images became a staple in the news industry and also for checkbooks or blue box or penny dreadfuls. You are probably uh, familiar with some images of Varney the Vampire and although leaning more towards the adventure genre than we would today expect um, appropriate or consider appropriate for a vampire, it gave, us for, it gave us the example of this iconic image on the right. The image flows around the textbook and it takes up most of the space. The most relevant and threatening features of the vampire come together in this picture attacking young women as innocent and vulnerable as they come, going straight to the throat and search for blood, which is extracted from the body of said young women by biting. The illustrator here focused on the stark contrast between the roughness of Varney given in many strokes, which results in a restless and dissected and wrinkled surface, which can be perhaps read as older age, but certainly as dehydrated hence the attack on the young woman, which here appears with an undisrupted decolletage in white sheets. So um, the visible age gap between the genders has also had always been used uh, throughout art history to express various messages. A heavily cited quote on the topic of illustrating the chat box or the blue box was the exclamation by one editor who demanded more blood, end of quote from his illustrators, then especially blood is infamously absent from most of the illustration of the time. Soon enough, the typical three volume Gothic novel, so talking Radcliffe and um, et al, reacted on this development. To include illustrations first became a unique selling point and then the standard. The readership from all classes now expected some images in their books. A prominent example to stress the appreciation 
of the illustration is this edition of The Castle of Otranto, which belonged to none other than Horace Walpole, the author of The Castle of Otranto himself. And as I would guess, a constant in your, in your lectures. He, of course, owned a first edition. And in his copy from 1765, we find this beautiful vignette. The two figures are caught in a gloomy vault. The young woman anxiously looks back over her shoulder and presses her right hand onto her chest. The man at her side has taken her left hand and is holding a gap in the floor for her. Their steps lead deeper into the darkness. At first glance, we can decipher the, the threatening situation. The specific trigger for the protagonist's fear, which forces her to descend into the unknown, is unclear, however. The corridors in the background, which are reminiscent of medieval walls, evoke a frightening and hostile atmosphere. Instead of a manifest threat, the viewer is shown an effective reaction to it. So we see the threat and the reaction of the woman, not by the surrounding or an approaching monster or something like that. Um, no additional light illuminates the cross vault, the ceiling of which has completely collapsed in the middle. Remains of broken walls are scattered over the ground. Everything is overgrown with plants. Ivy and ferns hang down picturesquely to the side. They frame the situation and dissolve the filigree into filigree shapes towards the edges of the motive. In this way, the uncanny and threatening are linked with, within the picturesque aesthetic and that is a link to elements of the architecture here, the Gothic ruin. But Walpole has let some uh, has <clears throat> let someone glue this picture into the otherwise not illustrated copy. The whole edition was not illustrated, and it was not until the 1790 edition that the Castle of Toronto came with pictures. Despite the clear indication of the later creation. Um, dating on the lower margin in the same catalog, the first edition is almost always referred to as illustrated. If older editions were newly bound and in the course of the 19th century to upgrade the copy or in the course of a restoration process, existing illustrations or thematically appropriate motives were added. This reveals an insight into the reading and collecting practice of the time but it inevitably leads to a falsification of the original furnishing and it harbors the potential for misinterpretation. So just a quick side note on or behind the scenes almost that the digitalization for us, of course, is a two-sided sword. This is very nice to have all those pictures digital available to us, but the image itself is not the only thing we have to, um, to uh, examine. We also have to see the book itself and see if it has been newly bound or something like that. For these traces can only be found in the original book if there has been a, a new bounding, binding and some images maybe have, added, have been added. In the later editions, where fronted pieces were added and from the 1780s onwards, the editor editors reacted to the growing demand from the readership for more comprehensive illustrations. So there not only was now one frontispiece, but a whole set of images. The decision about the scope of the images was mostly up to the publisher. The editors often worked with preferred draftsmen and engravers, but the resulting sheets were in no way tied to a specific edition publisher or even text. Printing blocks and plates were borrowed or copied and chained if necessary, and the motives were stolen as well. So before the Hogarth Act in the 19th century, it was, um, um, or the, at the end of the 18th century, it was almost uh, a common practice to somehow get hold of a motive and engrave it anew and then sell it. So there was no copyright. And um, I found one um, copy of the Castle of Toronto, which was listed as illustrated. And when I got my hand on it, it showed um, uh, a plate where a young woman in distress was, distress was shown. And one could tell, yes, OK, that's a damsel in distress. But um, the man who um, um, chased her through the castle wore a turban. So that was more uh, most likely an image from um, uh, Arabian Nights illustration, but it was bound into the castle of Toronto because somehow it fitted old man chasing young virgin um, fighting for her life and innocence. So 
Until the beginning of the 19th century, the supernatural appearances were almost entirely excluded from commercial illustrations. This omission, as well as the choice of the implemented scenes, are naturally dependent on the various aesthetics discourses of the respective time position of an edition. So here it's the discourse of the ruin, the sublime, the picturesque. In fact, oh here. in fact, of the first original illustrations of the text is a frontispiece which was engraved after the motive by Wiley Wright Reveille. In the mid 1780s, the architect Reveille traveled with Sir Richard Worsley to countries around the Mediterranean and made some, quote, topographically views and drawings of the celebrated remains of antiquity. And, quote, they were accurately measured and delineated, end of quote. A total of three views were probably created of which only two versions, the sepia one and the color drawing, you see here on the, on the um, screen, have survived. The monochrome sepia version is incorporated into the copy of the second edition from Horace Walpole's possession, which also contains the later graving we saw earlier. The monochrome, um, so the sheet shows the real castle of Otranto, the Castella Aragonese, on the Gulf of Naples, and it was sent to the author around 1786 by a friend. Although the view of the castle differs significantly from Walpole's personally favored forms of construction, which he, uh, with which he surrounded himself on Strawberry Hill, he found great pleasure that there really was a, such a building at the place he had chosen with the help of his atlas and because of its melodious name. It was really just, just there. He just chose the, the name um, Castle of Otranto by going blindly into an atlas. Still, and this is from, from a letter from Horace Walpole. Still, the drawing corresponds so very well with the circumstances of the narrative that I cannot help suspecting the idea was conceived or at least adapted to flatter the vanity of the author. Hmm. And I do wish you could be so kind as to inform yourself and then me whether there is in fact such an actual castle. I will tell you why I wish, you, I wish to know from more than personal curiosity. To be short, the drawing should be not imagin imaginary. I would have it engraved for a frontispiece to the Palma edition. I have done about myself. So um, Walpole really thought much of himself it seems. So he, uh, he was still curious if the castle was real. It mostly occurred to him that the um, artist or the architect Reveille would almost flatter him and invent something like that or just draw the conclusion. But of course the, the um, building was real and judging by his formulation, Walpole was attracted by the correspondence between the fiction and reality as the actual existence of the castle gave weight to his first, first forward from 1764. As we know, where he um, tried to sell us the story that someone um, ages ago um, translated an old tale. The scene is undoubtedly laid in some real castle. The author seems frequently without design to describe particular parts. So this is from the foreword where he tries to keep up those shenanigans. In addition, he saw the castle Aragonese shown as an adequate place for the manifestation of the circumstances described in the story. Even if it says little in the text about the external appearances and does not depict from the inside, uh, depicted from the inside uh, of the castle. The authenticity must have been confirmed because the motive became the first illustration for the first Castle of Otranto edition. And there you have it. We can find two versions of this plate, sometimes even bound together in one copy of a book. And both are also included in Walpole's private copy. So this is quite the pastiche, um, which is now, um, can be now seen in the uh, British Library. The spine really went through something, through all the rebinding process. But still no ghosts inside, as I promised you. <laughs> um, but what do we see? Um, what differences do you see?
before we get to the ghosts, and I promise there will be appear some ghosts, um, I would like you to take a close look at the images in front of you. Please, this is the first interactive part. <laughs> take your time and observe what um, you can see in differences, tiny or obvious. Um, we collect everything. And um, I would like to, yeah, collect what you um, found. I'm just opening the chat. Okay. What do you see? The more detailed buildings looks more ruined. Yes, indeed. Uh huh. Exactly. What else? Clouds in the sky. Yes. Exactly. Figures. Mm hmm. On the right. Yes, the angle is different. Perspective, exactly. There's a little shift in the placement of the of the, the building. And also the wall here in front has a, it takes a different route. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And it's more ruined, exactly. Good call. Okay, I'm now closing. Genau, there's humans. I'm now closing the chat and I try to anticipate your answers, and here we are. So Okay, the area in the foreground, as you already saw and mentioned, you see this is, and the area is much more broad, it's wider, and here the angle has changed. The proportions of the wall and the castle appear appears larger and closer. Uh, here is it a little uh, flatter and far away, and the stone walks take a slightly different course. On, on the left, it's somehow clean and proper, and on the right is rustic and decayed, and of course, on the right, people. And we will focus on those people. Here we are. The most important addition, however, are the two figures on the left of the picture. A monk in a habit with a rosary on it stands with a raised hand in the point and a pointing gesture opposite of a nobleman with a walking stick and a feathered hat, and he points to the castle in the background. His listener is visibly more oriented towards the narrator than towards the building itself. The story has a central monk figure in Jerome, that's given. But this narrative situation is neither explicitly nor indirectly reflected in the text. So where does this motive, this little scene stem from? The men, the men add a narrative and element in terms of content um, and could function as a general uh, marker for the aspects of chivalry, the man with the hat, the feathered hat, and the church as the hallmark of the Middle Ages. So we have the church and chivalry, and that summer, of course, uh, stands for the Middle Ages, and in this time could be just that, standing for these tropes and um, be signifier for even this. In the constellation, the edification of to original fictional author, authors would also be legible. So the Onofrio Moralto Canon of St. Nicholas in Otranto, who is named in the title as the author of the manuscript and the man, the nobleman with the feathered head could be William Marshall, also imagined translator as his listener. Both of course fictional characters invented by Rose Walpole to give an authentic impression to the text. In an intimate dialogue, they have now come together at the scene of the event and thus blur reality, which is still in, uh, visible in the building, for it is now the real image of the real building, and fiction, which is the narration. And um, at least on the second, since the second copy, we do know that it's still fiction and not an old manuscript. And it also um, could uh, present the different time levels. So we have the action and the creation. This is in the building, in the, in the castle. We have the translation in the group of the persons and the reception by the reader. And those uh, three steps are bound through this image. The elements of decay, which are not present in the extent, to this extent in any of the drawings as we saw for, um, 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 before, underlying the theming or different periods and their connection. Some stones are missing in the wall compound and the upper edge is just restless and broken up as the contour of the castle around the background, which you can see a little closer. 
This implies also a temporal distance both the reader and the figures are showing. Like the beginning of the wall, which is further towards the center, these serve as a respiratory motive that allow the viewer to visually um, enter the landscape. So this is a motive we also often find at Caspar David Friedrich, or I have something else uh, over there. Yes, these little figures at the bottom um, and not far away from the bottom of the screen or the picture um, invite us to step into the picture. They um, mark some a figure which you can um, identify with and then we go further into the picture. It's not just a random example here with Vermeer. Uh, as I mentioned, Caspar Dahl Friedrich is, is the poster boy of this, this tradition. So it encourages the reader just to step into the picture and somehow connects us, the viewer, to the other elements of the motive. Um, this has its origins in the fine arts, for example, in the representation of cityscapes, as you see here. These are often enriched by figures in the front segment that mediate between the architecture and the viewer. In a figurative sense, however, this also corresponds to the formal function of the two men within the narrative structure that was constructed via the first foreword. The modification of the drawn templates by such additions can, interpret it, can be interpreted as an explicit indication of the more complex semantics and reading of the sheet. In the later editions, when Walpole had revealed his authorship, these figures could still give the impression of an old tale told through the generations. This brings us to the end of the very, very, very shortened, maybe nutshelled glimpse into some aspects of the illustration. And of course, there also have been more characters shown. So I just showed you some examples which rely heavy on the landscape, but there's of course also some characters and figures shown, but I tried to exclude them now. And somehow there were even ghosts. Um, but that will be the topic for our second chapter. So not to confuse it, before we close the first segment and go into the questions, not to confuse, I will show you another version of this castle. And to be honest, I, it took me some time to somehow connect the dots because I was so um, focused on the other narrative um, narrating elements, as for here's a church, again, standing for the medieval and the, and the, the religious uh, underlying themes. Here are some persons, and we have a nice landscape, we have this uh, high upreaching structure, and we have this whole um, group of soldiers now going into the, the castle, and we have even a fortification over here. And it took me quite a while to um, look beyond this all um, charade and see that there, of course, is again this underlying structure of the Castello Aragonese. So you see here, it's very fragmented, but when you focus on it, you can see that the um, draftsman, the author of this picture, the artist, again, somehow must have known one of these uh, versions and just built on top of what you already knew. Okay, but no, um, this is not. This is one of the few um, images which is not bound in the Walpole copy. So this can be excluded. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the first segment. And I would stop my sharing. Hi, so we just start. So to send us in the next section. These are the takeaways from our first segment. So we have seen that the images became important for illustrations. It's not enough to have a compelling story, but now the readership demanded images. And the appreciation of the images can also be shown or seen when we look at such uh, books as um, maybe the copy of Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto, and of course in other um, archives, when we see that the images are bound um, retrospectively into the book, we can see that it was somehow important to embellish those, those texts and somehow um, get this illustration towards the, the books. And 
there might be a possible connection to the text beyond of plain retelling, which was my talking point on how to look at those two pictures, which uh, could of course be uh, two persons from the book, two characters from the book, or placeholders um, for the readership, or maybe something very, uh, something different, maybe the characters from the foreword of uh, Walpole. So these are the takeaways from the first segment. Let's go on. Next point, how to visualize the Gothic tropes and motives. As I mentioned before, the genre of the Gothic and its specific tropes were somehow new, not only for the audience, but also for the artists that had to illustrate those tropes. Of course, there has been images with Gothic appeal before, as we see here. This is from the churchyard poet Thomas Gray, and you see that there, of course, are some coffins involved and some um, very spooky trees and um, a graveyard as well, and all of that um, can be found. I, I guess there are even some bones lying here around, and this, this um, um, smoke up here is, of course, a memento mori, and um, this goes, of course, somehow in the, in the Gothic or, um, um, uh, as well. Um, but of course, this had not been the first time artists had to find a fitting representation for a new meaning or function of the images. The most prominent example in art history is, of course, the use of images for Christianity. The religion sprang from Judaism, which was for the most part an imageless religion. So how to tell the stories visually after the passing of time and the spatial distancing from the location in the Holy Land through missionization. And this made images and illustrations of the salvation necessary and they became the link and the proof for what has been happening. One theory is that the artists of the first Christian art turned to the remains from other cultures and religions that were known at that time and then they transferred them into Christian images. And yeah, I do have some, some examples. This is only a theory, you can, can um, go, uh, go with it or go against it. But um, the uh, talking points on the mummy portraits with are um, in fact uh, from Vex. So this is uh, wood and these are the coffins. Um, and on the coffin, on the upper part of the coffin, there's this portrait painted with wax and with heat. And you see that is somehow individual, that you can really um, see that it's not just a an, an, uh, random figure or a human-like shape, but these are always some enlarged eyes. You have a distinctive nose, you have a distinctive um, way how we see the beard or the, the hair. Um, women are very individually um, given. So this is an individual, not a kind of, of um, 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 random figure. And of course, it's the um, view to the viewer itself. So he straight, straightly looks at us. It's, he's almost given on fuss so that he um, shows his face full frontal. And that, of course, can be linked to, uh, the, for example, the icons from the Byzantine time. And one theory here is that these portraits might, may have been some origin or um, um, influence in um, the development of the icons. So, and there also we do have um, a very individual given person, uh, given on fuss, and um, that might be um, a string here, but also this. Um, <laughs> yeah. The representation of the mighty god Apollo was a model for a great number of characters, also in Christianity, of course. His image and the description fit many expectations of power and grace. And I'm showing you the description from Homer. Um, where he um, rages on about uh, Apollo. I will remember and not be unmindful of Apollo who, shout, who shoots afar. As he goes through the house of Zeus, the gods tremble before him and all spring up from their seats when he draws near. 
as he bends his bright bow. Down from the peaks of Olympus, he strode, angered at heart, bearing on his shoulders his bow and covered quiver. The arrows rattle on the shoulders of the angry god as he moved, and his coming was like the night. These are two descriptions given by Homer at the mighty god Apollo. He emphasizes the archery skills, his presence that makes the other gods tremble. That's quite the scene. And his, th his threatening anger. Apollo is quite the complex character, to say the least. He is the patron of the Delphi Oracle and the god of music. That's his nice side. His rage flares up big enough to kill 14 children with a blink of an eye or to skin a lousy flute player, all, all happened, while his anger over the whole, of a whole stolen herd of cattle could be appeased by the sound of music. So there's that. For Johann Joachim Winkelmann, which we call the father of archeology span and the father of art history as well, um, uh, the Apollo of Belvedere, this uh, version, this copy you see over here, was the most noble manifestation of the god. He said, of all works of antiquity that have escaped destruction, the statue of Apollo represents the highest ideal of art. So this was really a matter of fact. And everyone who belonged to the upper class or had a certain kind of um, education, of course, knew this statue from the one or the other, whether they traveled abroad in the Grand Tour or they, shot, they knew an engraving or something like that. In the Apollo Belvedere, the afar shooting god bearing his bow and his striding steps from Homer's praise are legible. He is shown in the moment after he presumably shot an arrow so you can see his, his one arm reaching out. This is holding the, the bow and the arrow has just flown away and the other hand is, is coming down. Um, while drawing the space, not only with an extending steps because he's here now in, in the moment of movement, um, but also with his look. He really takes the space around, not only uh, opens his arms, so he has an open posture, but he's uh, going forward and he's also looking around. Um, but also with this look that seems to follow the arrow into the indefinite distance that he masters. His front is open to the onlooker presenting his white chest. The chalmus, this is the drape he carries, uh, is draped over his active arm, even expands this impression. <laughs> There we are. The depiction of Apollo as an ideal of masculinity has inspired and influenced the countless number of artists of every art form through the centuries, like here Albrecht Dürer uh, or Benjamin West. There he is. The statue has also been praised in both literature and lyric, and was that was, of course, before under the impression of the Elgin marbles. Parthenon uh, sculptures, critics and writers and artists like Benjamin West, shown here, um, devaluate de the Apollo Belvedere in favor of the Parthenon sculptures. So there was a little fight between those two um, antiques. And um, for some, the Apollo of Belvedere was somehow then old news, and they looked forward to the or, or more turned towards the Parthenon uh, sculptures. William Hazlitt, for example, now called the Apollo statue positively bad and a theatrical coxcomb. Others, like Lord Byron, and there we are in the Gothic field again, remained true to the aesthetic represented by the Apollo. The poet praised him in Shirley Herald's pilgrimage in Canton um, IV, certifying to quote his radiance, majesty, delicate forms, and ideal beauty. Quote, end of quote. The type Belvedere in the arts was used to express those exact qualities and features, masculinity, awe inspiring appearance, wide ranging power, activity, and dominance. While at the same time, the posture itself was experienced by the viewer as an ideal aesthetic form. And now take a look at, let us take a look at the illustrations again. First, a short reminder how the statue and the pose was presented 
to the educated public. So this is again the quote by Homer. These aspects come together and hear me out um, in the second of the four frontispieces of Anne Radcliffe's novel, The Mysteries of Udolpho, in the first ever illustrated commercial edition by Gigi and J. Robinson. The infamous Signor Montoni echoes the Belvedere type. The illustrator adapted the stance and the slightly bent left arm, here resting on the sword handle, opening the figure to the right. The stepping stance in this scene cannot be explained through the story or the architecture of the scene. But here it has no other use than referring to a masculine ideal of strength and dominance. The gesture can be read, can be read not only as a sil as silencing Emily, but as a sign of actual spatial male dominance, as implied in the Apollo Belvedere as well. The compliments also the construction, this complements also the construction of the page in which Montoni is towering his seated wife and young Emily Saint-Bert, which is exactly the crucial point of the episode depicted in this great engraving. Emily's desperate solicitation will not be granted and her aunt, Mrs. Montoni, will be expelled to the remote East turret. The choice of the Belvedere type, of course, is also fitting given the description of the villain Montoni himself and him being the only one who can navigate through the labyrinth of the castle. Oh, sorry. This I missed uh, this morning as well. Here's the detail. Aha, you see, now, now it all makes sense. And here's the quote. This Senor Montoni had an affair, had an air of conscious superior superiority. Okay animated by spirit and strengthened by talents, to which every person seemed involuntarily to yield. The quickness of his perception was strikingly expressed in his countenance, yet that countenance could submit implicitly to occasion, and more than once in this day the triumph of art over nature might have been discerned in it. His visage was long and rather narrow, yet he was called handsome. And it was perhaps the spirit and vigor of his soul sparkling through his features that triumphed for him. Emily felt admiration, but not the admiration that leads to esteem, for it was mixed with a degree of fear she knew not exactly wherefore. But of course, it is not the Belvedere type that was adapted, let alone the antique canon that inspired and influenced the illustration of the Gothic novels. So not only the Belvedere type. Just as the Christian artists roughly 1500 years before, the artists of the 18th and 19th century also faced the task of conveying events and visualization certain entities without the visual tradition or language or form of its own. While sculptures from the third century referred back to antique and pagan imaginary that was char charged then with salvation historical meaning, the illustrators of the Gothic now found their figures and conceptual models in both antiquity and Christian iconography. So not only the antique sculptures, but also the Christian topics or forms of iconography and types were now included in the illustration of the Gothic. An example are the melodramatic illustrations for the 1815s Minerva Press edition of Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto. It was the first illustrated English edition of the 19th century. And it offered a set of 12 motives to the audience, some of them seizing on its predecessors. So in the beginning of the 19th century, there was now um, a, like a canon from certain motives which were constantly represented in the illustrations to the Castle of Otranto. And we already seen one motive, which was part of every set of illustration made from a different draftsman, but also always the motive. And that is the descending in the uh, deeper world from Emily. Um, uh, not Emily, sorry. And um, <clears throat> this is the certain type which also come with, which always comes with um, the, the Otranto illustrations. So, and three scenes from the uh, Minerva Press has been added to this canon, to the set of, of um, images we, which always were found in the set of uh, Toronto illustrations. 
This these scenes were new additions to the commonly chosen ones. Those that show female characters deeply moved by grief or benevolence or caritas. Two of them established the opening and ending. This is the op oh, there we are. This is the very first illustration of these this edition, and this is the very last. And this one we find somewhere in the middle. Um, <laughs> yeah. Two of them establish the opening and ending of the cycle, and third is placed in the middle. This opening does not represent to us the giant helmet which killed Conrad, the higher of Otranto and aspiring husband, but sets a different tone of perception. The mysterious event is replaced by the response to it by Hippolyte, Conrad's mother. And not only the image, but also the caption leaves the actual incident as a blank space, marking it both as something unspeakable and drawing attention to the depicted reaction, the emotions and the passion. The viewer enters the story with the emphasis on motherly love and pain and indulgence. So this is the tone that is set when you enter the castle of Otranto. It's not the gruesome helmet, the, um, the phenomenon that this helmet somehow comes from the sky and the murder of Conrad, but it is the image of the grieving mother. This motherly female ideal of sensibility is presented in a posture that recalls a well-known type of loving mother and suffering woman, the Virgin Mary, of course. Just like Our Lady of Sorrows, the type Mater Dolorosa, um, under the cross, the fainting Hippolyte has, has to be sustained. Her body is draped in a sweep facing towards the viewer with her upper body upright, her legs angled. This posture was used through the ages to, signif to signify the fainting collapse or death of the good and noble characters. This is not only reserved for, for the Virgin Mary, to be, to be fair, male and female alike. Famously, for an example, is uh, here Roger Vaden's deposition from the cross, where the correlative forms of Mary and Christ also uh, depict the bond between the two. You see that this angle here, of course, um, answers this from the Virgin Mary. Overall, those Minerva illustrations were made easy to perceive for the viewer. The light figures are placed close to the front and before a darker background. And I'm showing you just this one. Yeah. So they could stand out. They are centered and framed by a soft arch. The use of the very well-known posture from the Christian iconography again, as within the ancient Alpol Belvedere, lend extra connotations and it intensifies the emotional level the viewer could recognize in the figures. So we also know the semantic of this pose and we of course um, can easily read these emotions into the figure. The decision reading the kind and quantity, um, the decisions regarding the kind and quantity of illustration was always almost, always, always made by the publisher. For the Minerva Press in 1815, this was Anthony K. Newman, who inherited the business from his former partner and founder of the press, William Lane. At the end of the 18th century, Minerva was leading the production not only of the Gothic, but also the London market in general. Of all novels produced in London, a third came from Minerva. Both Newman and Lane were conservatives. To quote, uh, Hogarth and Catherine Ledbetter. Here. Lane's politics and his militarism are in conflict with radical feminism and democratic politics. Whereas Mary Robinson's letter to the women of England and Mary Hayes' appeal to the men of Great Britain articulate vigorous critiques of the ideology of sex, whereby women interests focus chiefly of or exclusively on the fiction of love. The Minerva Press was busy in selling those same fictions. Lane marketed stereotypes of passionate and intellectual women while Hayes and Wollstonecraft and Robinson were warning British women of the dangers of those stereotypes. So there seems to be a clash of two um, um, ro role models, uh, how women should be, should be approached and how women should act and what's the appropriate place to take. And on the one side, there, for example, were, were uh, Mary Robinson and Mary Hayes. And of course, 
or Stonecraft and so on. And on the other side, there were the publications and the portfolio as from editors as um, Lane and Newman. So it might be not surprising that the state of the female characters in the Otranto um, illustration is constituted by not autarkic and self-determined actions, but by their sensitive and emotional recreations to the male uh, reactions to the male characters. So the, the female characters are shown reacting and not acting by themselves. They somehow um, are dependent on the male actions. For this, the fitting or of the given text and the motive was neglected. So and the, the illustrators not um, seemed somehow not to be exclusively bound to the text or to the scenes that would stand out. Or if you would select um, the set of images from the text would make no sense. For the last scene in Monerva's Otranto illustration, again, fails to show the spectacle. No giant vision of Alfonso the Great breaking through the walls of the castle, finally holding Manfred accountable. Instead, we are witnessing the last breath of Mathilde de Otranto, who accidentally was stepped by her own father. In the plate, oh yeah, in the plate, she says goodbye to her lover, Theodore, but the novel itself does not allow the lovers such graceful moment, but a rather upset Theodore and a Matilda that alone seemed insensible to her own situation. Every thought was lost in tenderness for her mother. So in the book, her last thoughts are not um, directed towards the male protagonist or Theodore, but to her mother. Um, the subtext of the illustration reads, I am going where sorrow never dwells. And this originally is addressed to her mother, but the scene makes it seem like she is um, addressing Theodore. So, and um, be prepared for a clumsy and cringy transfer to the next topic. But as you could, uh, I hope I made it clear that the um, illustration of the Gothic is a rather Fran Frankensteinian creature or construct, and here we are finally addressing Frankenstein. Um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein itself is of course another example of how influential the dramatic adaptions of for the perception of the original text have been. So this is another important influence, not only the sculptures, not only the religious art, but of course the stage. Richard Brinsley's piece, Melodramatic Presumption, or The Fate of Frankenstein, first performed in 1823, brought us the infamous phrase, it lives. Today, of course, better known as It's Alive, It's Alive from the Vale um, uh, movie. And was um, this peak version was the first in a series of adaptions that reduced Shelley's eloquent and thoughtful creature to a one-dimensional threat for the sake of dramaturgy and thrill and thrill. In addition, the play heavily expanded the creature creation scene and awakening of the creature. And being, advertis and being an advertisement for said plays, of course, the playbills and the frontispieces focused on those distinctive features, namely the creation scene. Again, in the posture we see over here, we find some references to the antique, the primitive and the lack of civility or decorum, so the manner how to, to dress and how to, to move, um, could loosely be found in the Barberini Faun, which I don't show you now. That's a wild uh, creature leaning on a, uh, on a stone, showing himself with an open crotch and enjoying himself as well. And um, yeah, the title for Peak's Presumption in the Dick's Standard Place edition shows the idea of a savage and a strong uh, yet handsome and seductive slash creepy young man. He just broke through the handrail and comes now down the stairs, um, whose looks resemble a Greek affair. So a Greek um, 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 guy, a young man, a young Greek man, which uh, um, engaged in sports in the arena. Um, 
And it resembles more those Thebes and also this ideal stature and of, of mankind um, and man than a creature made from the deceased and buried and excavated body parts. Um, the disparity is even enlarged by Frankenstein frantically back, backing off. Um, this dual confrontation between the creator and the creation is very common for the illustrations of the novel. Frankenstein's turmoil can be found in different levels from being ready to fight the creature or just distancing himself to almost being helplessly hunched up. And in most of them, the fear of Frankenstein is understandable because here the creature is for one or another reason taller than the scientist. He is spreading his arms, dominating the entire layout. The composition resembles another resurrection from the dead, which left the onlookers shaking in awe and disbelief. And this is, of course, the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Now Frankenstein can be recognized as the shocked and frightened guard as, Christ's, as Christ's grave and the creature as Christ, no offense, rising from his tomb. Both the resurrection and the ascension typically stage Christ in an elevated position, spreading his arms and dressed in, volumin in a voluminous cloak especially in the ascension, he can be framed by an aura of light or clouds. In this iconography, we find a scheme or pattern to depict this constellation, and it was gladly adapted as a suitable formula without any restrictions because of the sacred origin. The steam, of course, also is, can, go, can be traced back to the theatrical effect that was used at the first appearance of the creature in the place. Um, at this point, the um, um, uh, theater, the whole magic of the theater with steams, with steam lightning effects or moving stages was in full, uh, full flow. And um, of course, such appearances were heavily used to, to show this effect and somehow um, show the magic of the theater and the play. And so this type of illustration does not, cannot only be traced back to those uh, iconography of Christ, but also is, um, um, is heavily bound to reality of the plays when they use all the effects of the theater. Um, so here, this Christian iconography and the mise-en-scene of the Gothic stage blend together flawlessly. And there we come to the end of our second Oh, yes. uh, our second part. And these are the takeaways I hope you could um, examine. Um, we see that the Gothic illustration, nonetheless Gothic, but was heavily influenced by Pagan and Christian art. And it was also influenced by the dramatization of the stage and um, the technical uh, me um, means of the stage. And um, the the use of a certain recognizable iconography was to address a certain market or to address a certain readership. If we see the Apollo of Belvedere, of course, some of the readership and some of the public would recognize this forms and this aesthetic. And to, to um, recognize this, this form also, of course, engages the reader. He feels seen and he knows that there's a certain discourse he belongs to and is somehow also a selling point. So these are the takeaways from this second segment. And again, I'm more than happy to see what's been discussed in the chat and our last segment. And that's called what's in an image. So how do images um, change the way we read Gothic texts or how do it, does bring and how does the image bring new meaning to our texts um, and this is the part where I would like you to do a little close reading but not quite yet. Um, the Robinson illustrations for the first 1799 edition of Anne Radcliffe's The Ministries of Adolfo set a different tone than the Minerva ones which I so showed you before. Not only did their complex construction give the viewer's eyes space and tonal variations, I'm just giving, going forward, oh, let's, let's take this. 
So you see that this is quite a different uh, menu to, to uh, draw. This is more complex to have this look out uh, into the landscape. This is not the easy access with the, the um, character standing close to the, to the um, end of the frame. And we have, diff we have not only black and white contrast, but diff different hues of gray. And um, yeah, not only did their complex construction give the viewer's eyes space and tonal variations to explore and enjoy, but Emily is granted the capacity to take action, to explore as well, to be curious. The third and fourth frontispiece here, uh, third and fourth from this piece. <clears throat> um, show first Emily and then Blanche de Villefort, a young woman whose life, courage, and curiosity are very similar to Mademoiselle Saint Aubert's in many aspects. Hence, the plates are structured likewise regarding the allocation of light and shadows, and both. And of course, both damsels are shown in a similar posture. The main counterparts were used to cut contextualize the events. Joanne de Lucia states in her um, paper that Radcliffe's switch from Thomas Hookman, who published her previous three books, to George Robinson was also the chance to see her novels in a new light. While Hookman was mostly present, present on the market for circulating libraries, the press portfolio of George Robinson included progressive content such as publications by William Godwin or Thomas Holcroft. This rendition of Emily as an active woman is even more obvious if you compare to the Robinson illustration, the Robinson illustrations uh, with a Paris edition that was published 1798 by Maradin. So. This is a little, um, a little etude I made um, today because we were talking in the first lecture. Hear me out. Not only you can, I think it's quite obvious that here uh, Blanche and uh, Emily do take the same action. They lean towards the men, although this seems quite frightening because this is the body of the dead soldier Emily finds in the vaults. This is not the, the famous portrait, not the famous curtain. This is a different scene. And um, this we discussed this illustration heavily this morning. And um, for me, this is quite the dark mirrored episode of what is happening. The second image is the dark mirrored episode of what is happening in the first. When we go back, we see that here is the family of Emily. And um, this heavily remains on, on conversation pieces, which were at this time, already a little old fashioned, to say the least. Um, this, um, the conversation piece was more modern in, in the mid of the 18th century. Think Hogarth, for example. But it also, it always shows the nucleus of the family, most sometimes inwards, uh, sometimes in the, in the yard, uh, sometimes with music as shown here. And you can see that the, the females are seated and the man is upstanding and um, take a leisure post, which seems unaware, not alert. And um, that's the same post that uh, Monsieur Saint-Bert takes in this frontispiece. And so uh, the viewer at this time knew how to read this frontispiece. They ultimately uh, made the connection between the genre they were, um, um, they knew and um, they see that this family is very content and very calm and very uh, well educated. They, um, the little, um, uh, the Emily, the, the young woman uh, plays, the, plays music and she might be singing as well. And we also see a very nice uh, contemplating a father and of course the calm surrounding by nature. So, this is what the contemporary readership all, all immediately knew how to decipher. And um, when we see over here, what I mean when I say this is a dark mirror, you see that the, um, I'm sorry, go back. You see that the calm pose of, of uh, Monsieur Saint-Aubert 
in Montoni's pose, which I try to, to uh, bound, bind to the Apollo of Belvedere, is, is um, quite the contrary. The hand is now on the sword, the arm is active, and he tries to install male dominance about the spatial um, um, place. And what has been here, a very calm and collected Emily is now on her knees begging her um, stepfather, no, not really, step uncle maybe, um, the villain as well, um, to, to be kind to her, to her aunt. And the loving and leaning, uh, the loving mother of Emily, which is here leaning towards her, trying to engage with her through the motion of her hands. I lost my cursor, oh no, there we are. Uh, is now uh, replaced through the very stiff, the very upright figure of the aunt, which is not um, engaging with Emily at all, but is the object they are talking about. So, and if we go even further, this is how we art historian go into the deep. This is this is our rabbit hole. So if you see here, this is quite the nice uh, triangle and we have the, the, uh, the, the line as a, as a base and this functions as a nice uh, um, yeah, figure. Here, the um, triangle is um, standing now upright and it's all a different dynamic by now. So it's a big, this is more likely, um, where, whereas this is a quite um, um, grounded pose, a grounded uh, form, this is more instable. This is stable and this is instable. Okay, so. And these, this is the interactive part. I would like you to um, just discuss and tell me how you would um, describe these images or to be exact, the role of the female of Emily um, in this French edition this French set of illustrations, just a few, just one or two years older than the English one. And uh, now we don't have a four volume um, set, but six volumes. And these are the first three images from the set um, edited by Mardin in France. And this is the second. Um, so these are the frontispieces for the six books. And I would like you to discuss or just write in the chat or um, tell me how you would describe the role of the female protagonist, whether it's Emily or it's Blanche over here. How would you um, describe that? I'm going into the chat. Okay. Yeah, yes. We had this 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 morning also. Yeah, this is um, this is of course a pose we also can find as a love interest. But um, going in this direction through the position of the of the mother, it I guess it would have been clear that these are married. And of course, it, it not um, there it doesn't show a disruption in the, the family, but also shows the more close bound between the father and the daughter when the mother is, is soon to be dead and they go on their tour through the Alps. Um, yes, yes, Fernanda Sud says the women are not active, merely reacting and victims. Yes, swooning was an acceptable life for women. Yeah, and uh, this morning someone brought up um, regarding this image that she was manhandled. So, <laughs> and I guess that's quite fitting as well. So, and you see, you can um, characterize that Emily and Blanche are here very passive as you already um, saw. And they are somehow, um, they, are, they relied on the actions by the man. And whenever in the book, is um, there is a story of uh, the slightest affair of curiosity by a female, we can say here that of course this curiosity is, um, uh, is a bad decision. 
So, and they should stay away from this curiosity. I'm sorry, I'm going over here, you see. And for those of you who remember the beginning of the novel, of course, this is not the, the scene which is, um, mar is, is marked in the book because here um, the father, Monsieur Aubert, um, leads the conversation and um, also this might not be a, a very critical scene. Here the, the little um, fight between uh, Monsieur Montoni and his, his opponent and in the back there's the female protagonist, so um, shoved all the way behind. And um, this is the um, burial of Madame saint Aubert, the aunt. And there we also see grief and fear and something like that. So this is the Maradon version from France. And now I present you the Robinson version again. And um, I would like you to just compare these two. These show the very two scenes. This is one chapter and they somehow relay on almost the same paragraph in the text. On the right, you see the Robinson version, first uh, English version uh, at the Robinson editors, which gave, like I mentioned, Anne Radcliffe a new chance to define her text and to have now a well-drawn set of images, which was one of the most reproduced sets for this text um, in the whole uh, century. And uh, where would you see differences? Again, state the obvious, if it's obvious to you. You can uh, write in the chat or um, you can just speak as you like to. So we have Blanche in the vaults or in the um, um, at the uh, um, headquarter of the banditi and they both hear a sound from afar and um, yeah they handle the situation quite differently okay the men, oh sorry, missed the chat. The men's attention in the second one is on the woman, whereas they're looking at first. Yes, exactly. Again, no, here is um, we this sequence is just a few sentences apart. And it was also an um, artistic decision which sentences, which scene was illustrated. And you see that the French version shows the um, the punishment for curious for female curiosity, whereas the English Robinson version somehow not is not rewarding the the actions of of Blanche, but we don't see fear over here. She is leaning into the soldier into the the, the uh, space of the banditi, although she is uh, surrounded by by uh, wild men, so to say, and. Just a few seconds later, the um, woman is held captive and manhandled, to quote, but it's the artistic decision which scene we chose to, to, um, to show. And this, of course, also, as, the, uh, as what I wanted to tell or to show with the um, Minerva illustration, this sets a certain tone how to read the characters in the novel. Okay, let's go on. Um, <laughs> okay. um, the rendition of Emily as an active woman is even more obvious if we compare the Robinson illustration with the Paris edition that was published in 1798 by Maradon. One would not think one that we were seeing engravings for the very same source. Instead of Emily, Valancourt is introduced in the first plate in a way that is, has nothing to do with the original text. I'm sorry, I'm going. This is the one with the, um, yeah, this one. Um, <laughs> first text, but is rather more dramatic. Furthermore, the subtext is an invention. So the text, the subscription for those 
uh, illustrations is completely fictive. This is uh, a text, uh, a phrase you cannot find in this in the original text. So this is also an invention. You see that the re reliability from uh, this edition is, uh, of a uh, set of illustrations is not really um, on point, so say the least. And instead of the young lady taking actions, we see the consequences of her perkiness. She's fainting or is abused by the banditi, always with a fearful look in her, on her face. So the message towards young the young female audience was quite different, which of course represents accepted conservative role of women in the society, as was provided in France, for example, by Rousseau, with Emile ou de la Education or Sophie ou la Femme. Those were two text, texts which really set the, the um, realms and um, laws how to be female, how to have uh, different features and how to act in society. The last important aspects of the inspirations for the Gothic novel can be found on the Gothic stage as well as the printed dramatized adaptions. Um, I guess on the time can that's gonna okay. And here I do have a last image, and um, you saw both illustrations. You saw the French Maraudin and you saw the English Robinson ones. The in first edition of the Robinson plates were um, engraved for a four-volume edition set, but in later editions and as other editors took the text and also published this, um, they separated the books differently. And instead of four volumes, it was now a five volumes text. And so there was a need to have a fifth frontispiece. And as you can see, not only because I enlarged the image, but you see that these, uh, this engraving is quite different from the original set. This is the one the editors of Long and Rees Armand Green which um, wanted to publish the fifth volume edition, um, um, uh, commissioned from a French uh, engraver. And you see the tone, again, is slightly different. Whereas we have, this was in the, in the Robinson edition was the first frontispiece and this was the second. The cut between, uh, to make it a fifth volume edition was between the first and the second edition and this now in the Longman Rees uh, set was the, the frontispiece for the second volume. So we have first this and then this and then this. And you can see that again, the role of the female quite differs from the one we saw in the original Robinson set. We here have a very passive uh, Emily and she is uh, very heavily um, uh, dependent on um, uh, Theodore and um, no, not Theodore. He's, she's very dependent on her male uh, companion. And uh, this is the meeting before they have to separate, before Emily has to go uh, with her aunt and, and Montoni. And not even is the pose and the posture very um, passive and very weak, but also the text is again um, a phrase which is uh, spoken through the male and not the female. And Bonacour says, Emily, said Bonacour at length, and he pressed her hand in his Emily. So this is very passionate and this is very romantic, maybe one would say. And this is nowhere that um, this would, um, if you if we would come across this illustration and this, this subtext, you would never think that the whole book is about Emily and her adventures, but maybe is a romance or uh, is a book about Valancourt. So you see that it's also a switch in tone and a switch in who's the, the dominant figure and who we think is the protagonist of the story. And um, this illustration stands quite out of this original set. So. The last takeaways for the last session. You see that there are differences in representation. I just uh, opposed the French and a French and an English one. There are much, this is a much more complex field, and I just um, um, showed you a very 
slight glimpse of, of the whole field where we can see what representation, for example, for female, for othering or um, other tropes and, and uh, genre could be, could be seen. And the illustration does, the illustrations do set a different tone and can even switch the interpretation for a text or a character. So this is, um, uh, I hope I make this clear in the last example. Okay, that's what I wanted to present to you today. And I think we touched all the points, but of course there might be some questions as well. I hope you took a little um, from this uh, talk and yeah, let's discuss. <laughs>